Um, I think I'll go ahead and um, get started. Um, so uh, my name is Anita Sefna. I am uh, an associate professor at Emory in Atlanta. And I think that um, if some of my residents are able to join this thing, they will. Um, but we also had uh, another kind of last minute switch. So if you have questions in the middle of everything, please feel free to um, raise hands, ask, chat, uh, whatever, whatever method is fine. Um, but today I wanted to talk a little bit about rhinoplasty uh, analysis and rhinoplasty planning. <clears throat> um, so I wanted to kind of take a look at this uh, because um, from Dr. Tardy about rhinoplasty because I think it brings up two really important parts about rhinoplasty. One is that we must have a really detailed understanding of the anatomy and all of the different things that we might encounter when we're lifting up a skin envelope. But the other part of this that's really critical is to understand that whatever we're doing is going to change over time and is going to have outcomes that we want to monitor over the course of that patient's recovery. So seeing your patients back, not just in the immediate postoperative period, but six months, nine months, a year, two years, um, all of these opportunities are opportunities for us to learn the consequences of what we do intraoperatively. So looking at your results really critically is uh, essential to ensuring that you're getting good, consistent results. Uh, I have no disclosures. <clears throat> so this is how we're going to proceed. Um, I might skip through some of the later portions of the talk, get pretty detailed into anatomy and maneuvers. So we might skip through some of that, but what I really wanna focus on is how do we analyze the nose preoperatively well and what are some standard things that we can do in surgery to get the type of results that we want. And we'll go over some cases to help us talk through that. So the first thing is to take a look at, um, at this patient um, and take a few seconds to look at the things that you think would be uh, potential areas of improvement. <clears throat> um, think about what you might, what you might want to do. Uh, and maybe if you can jot something down because we'll come back to this towards the latter part of the talk. Hopefully after we've talked about some issues and after we've talked about some techniques, um, you, you might have the same thoughts as you had at the beginning, or you might have some different thoughts. So it's nice to have an idea of that. And then here are additional think, views. I'm just going to give you a second. A little bit better. Yeah, that's better. Yeah. I'm sorry. Was that for me? Okay, so if we are to have a template for how we would want to analyze a nose, this is uh, the type of kind of basic um, issues that might come up, the things that we might want to kind of add to our checklist to make sure that we're analyzing as much as possible before we enter into a surgical plan. <clears throat> so we're going to kind of progress, hopefully rather quickly through some of these things. But when we talk about uh, skin quality, there are a couple of pros and cons to different types of skin thickness. Uh, thick skin, I like to equate to like a quilt. Um, and so when, when I have a patient who is uh, talking about certain things to achieve um, and they have particularly thick skin, uh, I will liken it to, you know, putting, building some type of structure and then putting a quilt over it which just makes it a lot harder to see the things that we're trying to see uh, versus you know, a sheet. So you have a remote control or a stuffed animal or something underneath the sheet, you can see uh, all of the outlines of that. And that uh, is probably not gonna be ideal. So there are some problems that come up with either of those. And not only is it 
critical for you to plan for that, but it's also really critical for you to manage patient expectations, to tell them that in a thin-skinned person, some irregularities can come up. It's not the end of the world. We can take care of it. We can help it. Um, and in a thick-skinned person, they might require a lot more frequent visits or at least more hand-holding through the process of recovery, which can take 18 months to two years to get the skin envelope uh, looking the way we want it to look. <clears throat> We then want to progress to looking at the frontal view in the upper, middle, and lower third of the nose. We want to look for the brow tip aesthetic lines. We want to see generally, does the nose look narrow? Does it look wide? We want to look at the tip, whether it's bulbous, asymmetric, or pinched. And <clears throat> the brow tip aesthetic lines are lines that come from the medial head of the brow to the tip defining points. It can be helpful when you're looking at a patient to actually, or a picture, to actually draw those lines um, because we can get lost in all of the other aspects of the nose or the face. And paying attention to these aspects uh, in a very systematic way can create your problem list for your surgery or your plan for your surgery much more efficiently uh, than bouncing around to a lot of different uh, areas. So the brow tip aesthetic, Generally speaking, the, the uh, horizontal thirds and the vertical fifths, these are all things that we want to keep in mind as we're analyzing a nose. And a quick word about the tip defining points. We would like to see two tip defining points. We want them to be symmetric. Uh, we also want the uh, alar rims to be oriented like a gull in flight. <clears throat> so we don't want those wings uh, to be too uh, elevated. We don't want the nostrils to be too notched. We don't want the columella to be hanging. Uh, so we want to have a general impression of a gull in flight. And then so that we can talk about bulbosity, tip bulb is, you know, we're seeing something different than the tip def defining points uh, that, we're, that we're noticing on the top picture over there. We're seeing the brow tip aesthetic line that has a rounded appearance towards the tip and does not gently curve towards the tip defining points. Uh, and so we wanna keep that into consideration as well. One of the things that I think is important is trying to visualize in this, we're kind of going off on a, on a tangent, but one of the things that's really helpful is trying to visualize what it is that you're gonna see when you look under the skin envelope. So when you lift the skin envelope and somebody has a bulbous tip, what do the cartilages look like? And you look at these cartilages and they're, my, they're a little asymmetric and they're a little bit full, but you wouldn't necessarily on first glance look at those cartilages and say, wow, person's gotta have a super bulbous nose. But in fact, that in combination with the thicker skin really gives the appearance of a very bulbous nasal tip. So it's nice to know what you're kind of going to expect because you also want to make sure that you can make it look different and then you want to plan for how different you want it to look. So a bulbous tip would look something like this. <clears throat> a pinched nasal tip is you know, the opposite of that. This is also something that we want to avoid. And oftentimes when we're pinching the nasal tip to give a really nice tip defining point, what can happen is you can get um, I'm going to escape this because I really wish that I had a uh, way to point out, but these little concavities can be due to a couple of things, but can be due to excessive tightening of those tip defining sutures, which we want to avoid. So if we lift the skin envelope, what are we going to see? We're going to see something similar to this. Now we might actually see a little bit more concavity just past the tip but we see a tip that basically has only one single tip defining point, everything's super narrow, super pinched. Um, the cartilages are flat, so they're not bulbous. Uh, we're not really seeing a lot of normal anatomy to the nasal tip, which we would like to maintain if we could. So too bulbous, not ideal, too pinched, also not ideal. What you would ideally like to see is something like this. So you see two tip defining points, you see a nice divergence. Again, I'm going to take this off. There's got to be a better way to do this. Um, you see a nice divergence here between the medial cura uh, and you see the, the lower lateral cura ending 
uh, not superiorly, not in the same kind of parallel to the septa, extending a little bit laterally too, um, which is what you would like to see to give you a nice tip contour with nice tip defining points, not an excessively ball-like or bulbous nasal tip. So when you're done with your surgery, this is what you would like to see. <clears throat> so if we go past the frontal view, we wanna look next at the lateral view. We wanna look at the nasal frontal angle, where the nasal starting point is, whether there's a hump, projection, rotation, all of those types of things. So we'll go into that. And I don't want to belabor these because that you all um, probably know and, and can easily read about, but you know, we want to be analyzing these things when we're looking at a patient, not only in the clinic, but when we're looking at their pictures for preoperative planning. So we want our uh, nasolabial angle uh, to be, sorry, we want our uh, nasofrontal angle to be somewhere around 120 degrees. We want to have a couple of different ways of assessing nasal projection. So here are a couple of different ways that we can do that. A line that is through the alar uh, crease, um, perpendicular to the Frankfurt horizontal. Uh, and we, uh, sorry. And we make a proportion with that uh, line to approximate 0.6. Uh, of the dorsum. We also do, we can also draw a three, four, five triangle with, <clears throat> with three being that horizontal line from the, the tip to the alar crease, uh, all the way up to the nasion and then along tangential to the dorsum. Uh, and then the last way, which is a kind of a simplified way of doing it, is from the upper lip to the subnasale and the subnasale to the tip. And those two lines would approximate each other. Obviously, having multiple ways of doing this gives you a little bit of correlation. So there are things uh, along the length of the upper lip that could alter at least one of those measurements. So having other ways of defining for yourself what you would think is over projection can sometimes be helpful. And then we want to shoot, so in the textbooks, it says that a nasolabial angle of about 90 degrees is appropriate for male patients, 90 to 95, and can go up to 115 in a female patient. Um, I find that excessively overly rotated. Um, and so in reality, the angle is uh, more uh, acute than that. But um, in your in-service exams or in your textbooks, you might see up to 115 degrees. <clears throat> And then also wanted to say a quick word about the oblique. So the oblique view can sometimes be uh, kind of discarded as not a very helpful view, but I think a lot of things can come into play here. Um, if you look at the oblique views, you want to look at the line of the dorsum from one side to the other. Um, and if you see two different noses, in the oblique views, assuming that the rotation or degree of rotation is relatively uh, symmetric from side to side, it will indicate to you that you might be missing a deviation that you might have that you might not have noticed on the frontal view. So it can be another uh, way for you to detect: uh, is the deviation in the upper third? Is it in the middle third? Is it the nasal tip? Does the nasal tip look like it's coming towards you in one picture and going away from you in the other picture? It can be really helpful to look at the intricacies of the oblique view for that reason. And then finally, base view, we want to take a look at a couple of things. Um, we want to look at the symmetry. We want to look at how wide the nasal tip is. We want to look at the proportion of the infratip lobule, which is the portion of the tissue that would make up the intermediate crura and the domes versus what would be consistent So we want about one third of the lobule, and this is mistaken, it should be two thirds uh, that makes up the columella. And then we also want to pay attention to caudal septal deviations. <clears throat> So when I am um, 
seeing patients and planning for surgery, uh, I have always been uh, told and have taken with me uh, throughout the early stages of, of rhinoplasty that I should do the surgery at least four times before the actual operation. When the patient comes to you mentally, you're preparing what you think would be reasonable because you want to talk to them about what you think would be reasonable. And then usually when they're coming for a pre-op or when, they're, when they've decided to proceed with uh, scheduling surgery, I look at their pictures again and I do another mental operation. Was my assessment initially the same? Do I have any new ideas? Am I picking up impressions? The night before we do surgery, we take a look at the pictures again and make sure our plan, uh, and I write out an operative plan of maneuvers that I think are reasonable. The morning of, right before, and then the actual surgery. So it's a good opportunity to kind of make sure that you that your impressions each time are similar, are they different, have the goals changed, et cetera. This is a really busy slide, but I think it's helpful to have something like this in your armamentarium, just so that when you are planning, you go through in a similar way to your systematic method of analysis, you go through a systematic way of surgical maneuvers. This is by no means a comprehensive list of all the surgical maneuvers, but it can be helpful to have a set of maneuvers that you can fall back on when you're first planning your operations. So we wanna proceed through systematically upper, middle, and lower third maneuvers. <clears throat> when it comes to the upper third, there are many different ways that you can choose to reduce a bony hump. Um, rasping, very common, but rasping a very large hump can be a time, very time consuming. So osteotomies uh, can also be helpful to remove bony humps. Uh, it's helpful to make sure that you're incising the periosteum before you start rasping, or you could be rasping for a super long time. I think it can be confusing initially to figure out why you would do osteotomy. So it's nice to know there are several reasons for doing them. One is if you take down a bony hump and it leaves you with an open roof, so gapping between uh, the lateral nasal bones and the vertical process, um, and you have gaps here, you need to close those gaps. So that can be uh, one reason that you would want to do osteotomies. Another reason would be if you have a very deviated nasal dorsum, so you need to reposition the nasal bones. And lastly, some people just congenitally have uh, very wide nasal dorsums. And because of that, you need to make cuts so that you can narrow them, but also reduce the density of those nasal bones. <coughs> lateral osteotomies are pretty standard. Uh, I'm not going to belabor this, but the traditional lateral osteotomy is a high, low, high osteotomy that starts um, high on the uh, nasal bone and or piriform aperture, you want to leave about three to four millimeters to make sure that when you osteotomize or medialize this segment, you're not causing piriform aperture. You start high on that piriform aperture, go low onto the face of the maxilla, and come high again across the nasal bones. And that is the lateral osteotomy. When you are at this medial most segment, you will twist and turn your osteotomy, which causes a back fracture that completes your medial osteotomy. So you're not making a formal medial osteotomy, but with your twisting of the lateral osteotome, you're creating a back fracture that allows that whole nasal bone to medialize. So a medial osteotomy is different. A medial osteotomy could be done formally uh, where you take the osteotome and you actually make a cut along the nasal bone. You can also do it incompletely, like I was saying before, where you cause a kind of unpredictable back fracture with your lateral osteotomy. So if we were talking about a true medial osteotomy, some indications for that would be if you have a very significant bony deviation that you need to straighten, if you need to mobilize the nasal bones medially as well, so that you can take an entire section of nasal bone and lateralize it or medialize it, then a, me a formal medial osteotomy would be helpful. If you only have a tiny hump and uh, your hump takedown has not fully opened the entire room, 
you might need to do a medial osteotomy if you need to close the open roof. You might need to formalize the medial osteotomy to give yourself some room to move that nasal bone. And then finally, if you have a very wide uh, nasal uh, dorsum, you might need to perform multiple osteotomies so that you can take nasal bones that are convex and wide and through a series of osteotomies, you can flatten the bones and change the position to make them a little bit more triangular. And that might involve not only lateral osteotomies and medial osteotomies, but a series of intermediate osteotomies as well. <clears throat> I'm gonna skip through uh, that section because um, it's a little bit uh, intricate. Um, so when we go from the upper third to the middle third, uh, a lot of interventions in the middle third involve hump reduction and then reforming the middle third with either spreader grafts or what would be considered auto spreader grafts. Um, so let's talk really briefly about that. When we are, I am doing a hump reduction, I prefer to do it uh, separately. So I separate the upper lateral cartilages from the midline septum. I reduce the dorsal hump of the septum and then make adjustments to the upper lateral to make sure that they have not been over reduced because usually you don't need to reduce quite as much from the upper lateral cartilages. <clears throat> um, once, we, um, once we separate the upper lateral cartilages from the septum and reduce the hump, we oftentimes will reform the middle third with use of spreader grafts. And the way that we're doing that, or the reason that we do that, is to avoid what we would consider an inverted V deformity. And an inverted V deformity is this shadow that is an upside down V. It happens because if we are reducing the hump in the middle third or we're separating or intervening in the middle for some reason, we may or may not have medialized the nasal bones. Either way, reconstituting the middle third with sutures, just suturing the upper lateral cartilages back to the septum, but this results in excessive pinching right here. Obviously, sutures are not gonna make any difference in the nasal bones. So you get this um, relief shadow that demonstrates to you where the separation is between the upper, uh, upper third and the middle third and we wanna avoid that. So with the use of spreader grafts or with the use of auto spreaders uh, or any number of different reconstructive, uh, but most commonly with the use of spreader grafts, we can then lateralize the upper lateral cartilages so they are more in line with uh, the same level that the nasal bones are in. Hopefully that um, makes sense. So, really brief pictures about spreader grafts. We're not gonna belabor that, but spreader grafts are cartilage grafts that are between the septum and uh, the upper lateral cartilages. Um, <clears throat> they reconstitute or help reconstitute the internal nasal valve traditionally. They can be used um, not only as straight pieces of cartilage that are placed between the upper lats, but you can also, if you have a significant amount of hump that was reduced, you will have extra length of the upper lateral cartilages. And those can then be folded, infolded, so that hopefully you can get something that is more akin to natural contour of the middle third um, to reform the uh, middle vault. So either with cartilage from the septum or with auto spreader grafts, you can reconstitute the middle third. So let's move on to the lower third, the nasal tip, which can be daunting, uh, I think, and, and we're not necessarily going to go through each and every one of these maneuvers, um, but this lecture will be available, so if you wanted to go back and look at things in a little bit more detail, you could. Um, I was wondering if anybody here wanted to um, shout out what they thought their understanding of the tripod concept was. Hang on one second. Um, does anybody feel like shouting that out? Um, <clears throat> sorry. 
Do you mean um, what creates the tripod and what you're trying to do as far as tip? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Thank you, Celeste. Oh, <laughs> sure. So um, the tripod, I guess, concept is technically the um, two medial cura of the lower lateral lateral cartilage is coming together to make sort of the center limb of the tripod. And then the two paired lateral cartil lateral um, portions of the lower lateral cartilages making the other two limbs. And essentially you're mm -hmm. determining um, projection and rotation of what you want for your final result for your tip of your rhinoplasty. And so by doing certain maneuvers, you are gonna change the projection and rotation of that tip based on where you put graphs or um, do certain techniques along those um, three limbs of the tip um, to achieve that rotation or projection. Great. So um, I, I think um, even years and years after doing uh, or starting to do rhinoplasty, I think the tripod concept it can be very helpful. Um, it is a simplification, but it's very helpful uh, definitely in learning about rhinoplasty, what the different options are to manipulate the tip. Um, this is, again, by no means an exhaustive list of all of the things that you can do using that tripod concept. But I think uh, in, in learning about what the options are for manipulating the nasal and the tip cartilages, um, it can be very helpful to write out kind of a grid of what options you have to do the things that you want. So if you want to take the tip cartilages that seem under rotated and you want to rotate the tip cartilages up, what are my options? Um, if we want to improve projection, we have a short nose and we want to improve projection, what can we do? So having a list of these things kind of in your back pocket at all times when you're looking at a patient's nose, you can automatically look at this list. Is this something that I think would be appropriate to do in this case? <clears throat> I want to spend literally a minute or two talking about lateral curl steel and lateral curl overlay, which I think are very advanced concepts. So it's not for everyone, but I think that there are probably some people here who um, would benefit from hearing about the difference between the two. So. Uh, it can be uh, confusing initially, but hopefully with the help of diagrams and, and pictures, please ask questions if you want, um, we can illustrate the, the difference of the utility of both. So a lateral crural steel procedure is where you are taking tissue or you're taking the lower, so if this is my medial cruse and this is my lower lateral cruse, I am recruiting tissue from here by grabbing a suture and adding length to the medial cruise and reducing length of the lateral cruise. So based on, based on suture placement, we're recruiting tissue from lateral and giving to medial. And as you can see in the upper diagram, we're adding that, by doing that, we're improving projection. A lateral curl overlay is literally, again, this is the medial cruise and this is the lateral cruise, making an incision has to be lateral to the dome and taking this segment and overlapping it. And so we think that originally looks kind of like this, we make that incision, we overlap it or telescope one segment back to another. And what ends up happening is that that section gets rotated back. If you look back at that tripod concept, you'll see that if we shorten the limbs, that are making up the, the lower lateral crew, if we shorten these limbs uh, of the tripod, we're rotating that nasal tip up. So I just wanted to kind of put those, that vocabulary out there just in case you're reading about it and, and uh, are not clear on what that means. <clears throat> Obviously, in some cases of tip asymmetry, we can overlap them asymmetrically the time we're, we're trying to achieve that uh, asymmetrical reduction. Columellar struts are probably being more overtaken by uh, things called the caudal septal extension grafts uh, now, but what you might read about or study about uh, in in-service time is a columellar strut graft, which is placed between the medial cura. And the benefits can be several. You know, we can have a little bit of improved 
tip support. Um, we can straighten crooked medial cura, and we can help with projecting the nasal tip. Um, one tip is that we want that columellar strut to approach the nasal spine, but not sit uh, overly long or sit directly on the nasal spine. The only reason for that is a, a really annoying uh, clicking back and forth uh, in the post-operative patient to that point that when they blow their nose or if their nose mo moves, nasal tip moves, then they feel a clicking on the, of the columellar strut on the nasal spine. So cephalic trim is probably something that, that everybody is aware of to some extent. Um, and uh, I'm gonna pick on Celeste again. Um, Celeste, are you still there? <clears throat> yep. What, um, what would be the reason for wanting to do a cephalic trim? Ooh. What are some reasons, not the reason, what are some reasons that you would wanna do a cephalic trim? <clears throat> so, um... Well, A, it can bring up, if you have really low-hanging uh, ALA, so it can bring that up to um, in kind of bring those up. Um, also, additionally, um, it can help with rotation um, and provide more rotation by doing that um, steel. And it would also deproject. So I think that um, the rotation aspect is, is a good one. I think that's the one that we read about or learn about. And I think the reason that I want to mention that is that it is a very unpredictable way of rotating the nasal tip. So the reason that it rotates is because we are impacting the scroll, right? So here's the scroll, the interaction between the lower lateral cartilage and the upper lateral cartilage. When we remove this portion of the cephalic uh, lower lateral cruise, we're creating some potential space. And when we create that space over time, the patient's nasal cartilages can kind of float up, act up, but it's really unpredictable. And so for us to say um, cephalic trim causes rotation, it's absolutely true, but you can't say, well, I want the nose to rotate you know, a few degrees, and because of that, I'm gonna excise this many millimeters of cartilage rel reliably in each patient. Um, so yes, cephalic trim helps with rotation. Um, it reduces the fullness and the bulbosity. So we're taking some of that convexity and reducing it. And then as you can see in that lower picture here, once we put those suits, just the act of weakening that, um, Cruise by removing that extra cephalic portion, we weaken the overall strength of that lower lateral cruise and we can deform it more easily with sutures. So I'm not necessarily sure about the projection aspect of it, except yes, it reduces the bulbity. It more helps with rotation and decreasing uh, the, the bulbosity of the nasal tip. So the big reasons to do it but you also have to understand that by doing it, you are interrupting the scroll uh, and reducing some of the tip support mechanisms. So you have to do other things to reconstruct the nasal tip support. <clears throat> and some of those things involve sutures. So placement of inter and intradomal sutures not only deform the tip and help with tip contour, but can also lend a little bit and I, I stress a little bit because cartilage grafting, like a caudal septal extension graft or even a columnar strut would do more for that, but definitely will make your tip a little bit stronger, a little bit more. Um, just uh, as an aside, for those of you who are doing a lot of rhinoplasty, um, I usually, I do not use any permanent sutures. Um, 5 PDS is basically what I do for almost all of the sutures that I place in, the, in uh, rhinoplasty. Um, and um, reduces the risk of extrusion or palpable suture down the road. Um, and yes, tip uh, for, for um, nasal tip sutures, make sure that you're placing the knots uh, on the medial aspect so that they're not palpable. Um, one thing that is, um, as an aside, I put a little 
um, section right here, which I'm not sure that you can see. Um, this is uh, a slide from one of Dean Toriyumi's talks that is quite helpful in visualizing what you want your nasal tip to look like. So we talked initially that, you know, you want to thinking constantly about what you're going to find when you're under the skin envelope. And then once you open the skin envelope and look at the tip cartilage contour, you want to be visualizing what you want them to look like at the end. And so we tend to focus on making the tip narrow, um, reducing the fullness of the lower lateral cartilages. But one of the things that we forget about is the orientation plane of the cephalic uh, border of the lower lat in comparison to the caudal border of the lower lat. So <clears throat> I'm gonna go back to this analogy, the, the medial cruise and the lower lateral ass or the um, lateral cruise. Um, when you're putting your tip defining sutures and you're trying to define this nasal tip, you also need to look at you know, how the caudal border is oriented to the cephalic border. What we don't want is as we're putting those sutures, we don't want this caudal border to drop significantly. Um, we want this caudal border to stay high. And if we don't keep that caudal border staying high, we get this pinched appearance because there's no support right here at this lateral ala. We want this uh, caudal border, this caudal border right here, to be more parallel to uh, to the cephalic border. And I don't know if I'm making myself clear because it can be a really difficult concept, um, but it's one of those things that I just want you to have heard so that when you're looking at your nasal tip finally finishing up your rhinoplasty, you pay attention to whether or not the position of the caudal border is at the same plane as the cephalic border. And quick word about tip graphs, <clears throat> which also can be very, very helpful. I will say for patients that have very thick skin, one of the things that can be uh, conceptually important to understand is um, if you have a thick floppy skin envelope and you've put your tip sutures in and you're considering putting a tip graft in um, and hopefully putting a tip graft in, the way that that tip graft or any of the cartilaginous structures underneath should be uh, treating the skin is it should be putting that skin outward so that it is not just kind of causing the entire structure to collapse. And the reason I'm saying that is because I think sometimes we'll use ear cartilage or weaker cartilage um, to build support. But if that skin envelope is really thick, the heat and contractile forces that that skin envelope is exerting on the underlying structure is going to squish everything and just make it amorphous over time. And so we want things that are going to actually be rigid enough to hold that skin envelope and withstand the contractile forces and the weight of that heavy skin um, much more than we would in a medium or thin skinned person. So I think that that's a concept that uh, is important to keep in mind when you're dealing with these patients. When we're doing a shield graft, which this is what a shield graft looks like, we want that shield graft to extend a little bit beyond the cartilage, we want it to be super stiff. We want that cartilage graft in and of itself to be supported so that the heavy skin envelope isn't just, um, isn't just crushing it over time. Um, and I think we talked about spreader grafts. So I think as the internal nasal valve uh, uh, graft, and I think it's important for me to at least have said that, you know, a batten graft, which I do frequently, I do the graft that we're, going to show uh, in a second is the graft that I usually do to support the lateral nasal wall. But um, the batten graft is the traditional graft that kind of sits, uh, as you can see, lateral to the lower lateral cartilage. So uh, lateral to the lower lateral, sitting on the piriform, uh, is a sizable um, piece of cartilage uh, to support and withstand the um, collapsing forces of the lateral nasal wall. Um, 
it will add a significant amount of fullness, which in some people is not, um, is not a problem. But in a functional rhinoplasty patient who desires improvement in breathing, but also wants to balance the cosmetic outcome, um, this uh, isn't always the best choice. <clears throat> a lateral crural strut graft um, is the uh, answer to, you know, supporting the lateral wall, hopefully in a more cosmetically sensitive way. Um, so again, these pictures are actually from uh, Toriyomi again, but we see bulbous cartilages that are kind of weakened and uh, not that supportive on the top picture. We see that the cartilage has been raised and separated from the vestibular mucosa. Septal straight pieces of septal cartilage have been sutured to the undersurface. That does a couple of things. It straightens that cartilage from the convex, uh, convex appearance, but it also gives it rigid support that extends it a little bit further and can then be tucked against the piriform aperture again. So now you're creating uh, a supported lateral nasal wall, but you're also improving the aesthetics of it. And so we call those lateral cruel strut grafts as opposed to the batten grafts, which are overlay grafts, the lateral cruel strut grafts are underlay grafts. Um, and this is a nice little algorithm. I wouldn't expect that um, with a single lecture that anybody would remember it, but it's a nice little um, thought exercise. Um, patients can have excessively uh, wide ALAR flare, but they can also have excess sill width. And you can see the two uh, pictures on the right side where if someone has a lot of flare, uh, you might uh, just want to do traditional uh, weir excisions. Um, if their nasal sill is excessively wide, you want to combine it with a sill excision. And so I think um, it's easy to um, just go fall back on traditional weir excisions, but sometimes the nasal sill needs to rest as well. And this is a way to do that. Um, as you can see from the um, lower diagram, um, there is a, um, you know, the flare excision, but then it comes kind of as a, at a 90 degree angle into the nasal. And there is some reasoning behind that because we don't necessarily want to just um, create a slit like a uh, scar, the nasal sill, which can be really um, noticeable uh, postoperatively. So having that 90 degree uh, well-defined turn uh, reduces the risk of it looking just like a slit incision in the nasal sill. <clears throat> Breaks up the scar a little bit. Okay, so this, is the, this was the case that we had started with at the very beginning. And I wanted, um, Celeste, I hate to keep picking on you. I promise I'll pick on some, somebody else. Um, but I just kind of wanted you to go through on the front and side what you thought some of the issues might be. And then maybe we can talk briefly about uh, what to do about it. Okay. Um, so I would start by saying this is a 20, 30 something year old with probably Fitzpatrick to skin. Um, from the frontal view, uh, it looks like she's got kind of a widened um, middle third. Um, and maybe a little bit of a bulbous tip. Um, her ala look like they're in line with the medial canthus, so, or, um, so it doesn't look like she's a very widened base, per se. Um, so from the frontal view, mostly I would say she's got a widened middle third um, and a somewhat bulbous tip. From the side view, um, <clears throat> she's a little bit of a dorsal hump, um, and her, but I think that her tip looks um, pretty well projected and rotated just from briefly seeing she's got a pretty good one-to-one um, -one relationship of the nasion to a nasal tip and then, or sorry, the subnasality to nasal tip and then the subnasality to the upper um, lip and follows kind of the um, three, four, five principle. Um, so I think that and she doesn't really demonstrate a tension lip. Um, so I think overall I would, and um, did you all say anything earlier about how she was breathing? Is she having any difficulty? Uh, no, I, mean, we, uh, I think we can, um, I, I, she did have some functional issues, but it's fine. I, that, this was more kind of the, the kind of external. Oh, um, the, um, the 
the only thing that we didn't talk about, which we, which I should have mentioned, is it is nice to conceptually think about where the radix is falling um, and where you want the radix to fall. So um, we ideally, the radix is an area that comprises kind of the root of the nose. But if we were to say it's really the starting point of the nose, um, we want that to be in the supratarsal crease. So say that her radix is a little bit caudally positioned. So I think her radix is probably somewhere around the pupil. Um, I, and I don't even think that I did anything about that in her, but I do think that it's a nice illustration of something relatively subtle in this case um, but something that can help um, with your maneuvers, because if you decided that you needed to change the position of her radix and put some cartilage here to, to make her starting point a little bit different, then it would address some of the other things that you're doing here. So not, not critical necessarily in this case, but we didn't talk about that. And so I think it's important to mention. Okay. Um, so let's, uh, let's quickly just go through the oblique and the base views. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so again, I, you can see her asymmetry of her, um, and the, on the oblique, oblique views of her dorsum and it looks widened. Um, and then you can also see the dorsal hump on, from both views. Um, on her base view, you can see that she's got a widened base of her columella and it also looks deviated um, towards the right. Um, and what would you say about her in tip lobule to columella ratio? You know what you want those to be? You actually were here when I started, but I wasn't sure if you remembered. Well, so you want the, um, it's basically in thirds, but you can see, but you want the um, nostril to be two thirds and then the tip to be one third. Mm -hmm. So she's got a little bit of a boxy tip. Mm -hmm. um, and you can see that her nostrils are asymmetric with the um, left being a little bit more narrow, do, and you can see the deviation of the columella, and that she could probably, it looks like her nostrils may be more than two thirds of her base view. I would say she's probably closer to like a 50-50 here with yeah. her in her tip lobule and her columella. Right. Um, the one thing on the oblique view here is my, my, thing with the oblique view is that can be really helpful to show you asymmetries that you might not have noticed on the frontal view. So when we looked at her frontal view, it wasn't that obvious that she had much deviation. When we look at the oblique view, we can see, yeah, we see a hump here and we see a hump here, but here in that middle third, she looks way different in that left picture than she does in the right picture. Right. And so what that clues us into is let's look back at that front view and say, and see like, wait, like she's this little depression um, right here that is not that obvious on the frontal view the first go around. Right. And so it clarifies to us that we might need to do something here in the middle vault. There might be a dorsal septal um, there might be a dorsal septal deviation there. She might have a collapse of the upper lateral cartilage on that side. Like we need to kind of investigate that a little bit further. So I think the, the oblique views can be helpful from that standpoint. So let's now go to what we did. So our goals were at the time um, to improve breathing, consider batten grafts, but she was very um, uh, convinced that she didn't want any additional fullness there. She wanted the hump gone, the tip smaller, and she felt like her nose did not match her face. It did not, her nose was bigger than she wanted it to be. So these are the things that we did. Um, reduced the hump. We did a right spreader graft because she had that dorsal deviation, um, a columellar support the tip, bilateral cephalic trim. Um, seven to nine millimeters is ideal to leave behind. That's probably on the more conservative side. Um, did a tip graft did osteotomies, and then that was her side view, close to, uh, you know, almost a year, but not quite, and then the front view. So the osteotomies were really helpful in creating a more, um, a more ideal, though still wide, more, more ideal um, 
dorsal aesthetic lines or aesthetic lines, more straight, not perfectly straight. Um, it moved, uh, but not perfect proportion and not perfectly straight from the base view. Um, like I said, important to at your own results and say, what would I have done differently? What did I do well? What did I not do well? Um, I think probably still excessive fullness in the middle third and a little bit more width than would be ideal, um, but overall improved um, and improved breathing. So I would like somebody else, and I'm trying to figure out here who we could ask. Uh, Denise, are you here? I'm is here. She, <laughs> is she going to pretend to not be here? <laughs> um, okay, so I just, want, Thank you. <laughs> I just want ideas. I want, like, what do you think when you look at this lady's nose, what are your thoughts about what, what issues you'd like to correct? Sure. So when I look at this lady's nose, I'll look at it in thirds, upper, middle, and lower. So um, on frontal view, she looks like she has pretty good dorsal aesthetic lines um, with a nice narrow dorsum. When you get down to the tip, you can see that there's asymmetry. You can look at the, and the middle, middle third as well isn't, isn't too wide or anything. When you look at the tip, you can see the light reflexes are a little bit um, asymmetric, which clues me into maybe the domes are asymmetric or there's something going on there that I would want to address. Um, her nasal base looks, her ala look asymmetric as well. Um, and I would have to look at, and I haven't even looked at the basal view yet, but it, it looks like one side of the base is higher than the other. So that would clue me into maybe there's something going on with the like the base of the nose, the actual face, the bony face. Um, and that also clues me in because she has like a deeper nasal labial fold on the left and the right and things like that. Um, and I honestly with this, maybe it's my screen, but I can't quite tell on the front what her infratip lobular or anything looks like. And she also looks like she may have a little bit of that shadow between the tip and the ala, cluing me into the fact that maybe there isn't enough support right there. It just has that bulbous look, like the tip is separated from the ala. And then moving in from the lateral view to the right, she has um, a good nasal radix. It, it looks like it's just in line or maybe even a little bit higher than the tarsal crease. Um, the, she looks like she has a hanging kind of, well, middle third again, it looks okay. Um, lower third. The tip again on the side looks a little bit bulbous. She almost looks like she has a poly beak right there with the super tip fullness there um, rather than a super tip break. And her, she, her infra tip lobule is probably a little too much, but I'd have to look at another view. And she looks like she has a hanging columella as well. Um, and then moving over it's the basal view, she does look like she has some like just basic facial asymmetry at like the piriform bony area. Um, her nasal tip looks deviated to the right. Her infra tip to tip ratio to me, it looks like it's closer to 50-50, or maybe the tip is just too much compared to the infra tip or the columellar height. And then her ala are asymmetric, her medial cura are kind of um, sticking out into the nasal airway, but there isn't any clear like septal deviation that I can tell on my screen. Mm -hmm. And then looking at the um, oblique views, she does again look different from one view to the other, which in the middle vault, um, Actually, in the oblique view in the top, I guess that's considered a right oblique if you're looking at the right side of the face. I'm not sure. Um, she looks like she has a depression between the upper and the middle thirds. Mm -hmm. so I'm not exactly sure. But the she left kind oblique. Of, she kind of almost has like a, the impression of an inverted V, but you know. I'm, what was that? Yeah. yeah, almost. It's like that shadow, but I can't quite tell. Oh, and now so, that I look at the front, again, it's a little bit more obvious on the right side. Yep. yep. 
of the middle third, it, there's that shadow there that I didn't notice before. So that that's why, do you see also like, um, and that was, that was really good and very comprehensive. I have a couple questions, but do you see how like, it looks like the tip is kind of going away from you in that mm -hmm. um, oblique, the top oblique, and it looks kind of like it's coming towards you in the bottom oblique. Yes. Um, I think that you, you would have picked up on and noticed the asymmetry or the deviation on the frontal view, but if you hadn't, then this, the oblique views would definitely cue you into, you know, there's middle and lower third deviation here that, that are pretty marked. Um, and just look back at that frontal picture again. Mm -hmm. um, and then you definitely mentioned her Colleen Miller show. So what do you want her Colleen Miller show to be ideally? Uh, so I, I'm not even sure if this is correct, but ideally I would look at the nostril shape and if it's like a horizontal oval, you want like half of the show to be, you know, half of the space to be above, meeting the edge of the A lab, and then half the space to be below. Yeah, so yeah. I don't know if that's correct though. So you want it about two to four millimeters of Kali Miller show. Mm -hmm. um, and what did you think about her projection and her rotation? She's a little, well, with the Kali Miller show, she looks under rotated. She looks like she's almost less than 90. Mm -hmm. Um, and you'd want her to be closer to like 95, 100, 105, I guess. Um, and then projection, she's over projected. But, and then looking at the, she looks over projected, but I don't know what the official way to determine whether or not she's projected. The two thirds, one third, I guess. But no, that's proportion. No, that um, like a three, four, five is, three, a, four, is five, one right. way. So I think her three limb um, is probably, so we want, if we're doing three, four, five, we want this limb to be three and, mm -hmm. and we want this limb to be five. And so we probably have a little bit more than three here. I see. Um, and so we would, we would make the uh, kind of call that she would be over projected. Why okay. don't we, um, let's go to anybody else. I'm trying to think. <laughs> um, Patrick, Patrick, can you come up with some things that we could do to address some of the issues that Denise brought up? Yes, yes, I can. Um, so I think with the rotate, so the, the, I think she needs a uh, so open septal rhinoplasty. I think she needs a, um, as far as the Kai Miller show, um, there may be some support with the Kai, Kai Miller strut. Um, and if that reduces some of that hanging, we could also do a, if it doesn't, we can do a cephalic trim to project a little bit. Um, the, as far as decreasing projections, which I agree she definitely needs, um, you could do, um, I think we talked about doing the lateral core steel to kind of decrease that. Um, she has a boxy tip, which could be um, some of the soft tissue can be slightly resected and then work on some of those tip contouring um, uh, techniques that we talked about with the uh, interdermal uh, uh, sutures. Um, look at her, um, when you look at that, that frontal view and the, the light reflex, it seems like she um, if her tip is a little, if we determine her tip's a little deviated, maybe to the left, um, we could um, take more on the right on that, uh, 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 like an overlay and kind of pull that tip to the right a little bit. Um, I, don't, I just don't know how much I would do with the actual dorsum um, out of fear for um, creating a saddle nose because her, she doesn't really have that much of a, um, a raise um, at the nasal bones or at this at the uh, cartilaginous septum as well. So let me go back to. Um, we're going to go back to our tip things, and see if I no it was before that. Okay, so increase rotation, increase projection, decrease rotation, dis decrease projection. So. Um, I see her biggest issue as being over projected. Um, 
and or I saw her biggest issue as being overprojected. So there are going to be other things that we might have done to the dorsum, but I'm not going to belabor that. Um, here are some of the things that we can do, some of the things that we can do to decrease projection. Um, I think I did all of them. We'll, we'll look at my uh, kind of post-op plan and see uh, what we ended up doing. But these are some helpful things if we want to take the tip and bring it closer in uh, to the nose we or to the face. We also wanted to improve rotation. So these are some of the things that we can do. And you, Patrick, I think you mentioned an overlay um, for symmetry, but also to increase rotation. So th those were some of the things that we did. Um, so here, I don't know if you guys can see all of that. And I, and I know that we're running a little bit close to time. So I'm just gonna go through this kind of quickly. Um, these are the things that we did. The full transfiction incision, which really decreased the amount of overall tip support so that the tip could actually just kind of fall in closer to the face. Um, posterior septal angle trimmed. Um, did the cartilage graft, spreader grafts. We did the right side thicker than the left because she had that kind of collapse on that right side. Um, cephalic trim, tongue in groove. If you don't know what a tongue in groove is, essentially it's resetting or telescoping the tip cartilages, the medial cura, onto the septum, which can be helpful for a columellar hanging or increased cellular show. If we look at this frontal view, we said at the beginning of the talk, we want this kind of gull in flight. Well, this gull looks like it's about to take off or land. So the wings are super high in comparison to where the body is. And we want more of a gentle curve. So we need to take this part and pull it up. And a tongue and groove can be a way of doing that. <clears throat> and then from the side, she still has this little depression. So this is one of those things where I look back at my results and I say to myself, what are some things that we could have done differently? Well, I think putting some cartilage here, putting some alloderm here, something to help what she clearly had already, but maybe I had failed to recognize the extent to which she had it. Or I thought that if we reduced this, we could bring it all in line. Well, she probably has some inherent loss of support right here at the keystone. And so putting some cartilage there would have been helpful. Um, so deprojected the tip, rotated the tip, uh, decreased the show. Um, yeah, and then from the base, uh, took what was an over, and I'm sorry that these are not exactly the same degree of angulation, uh, gave we, because we deprojected, this is important, because we deprojected, we took some of this length and it translated to increased. I don't think that this is overly excessive. I don't think that I would go back, uh, do um, weir excisions necessarily, but one thing to make sure that you think about yourself um, is the more, you know, the closer you bring the nose in, the wider you're gonna get your alar flare. That, that length or that tissue has to go somewhere. So thank you guys. I, um, I'm not gonna go through that one. Um, the, the last one I was gonna say is, this is probably one that would be, I would consider like a more uh, case, um, revision, rhinoplasty, um, really narrow from the front, which she liked, um, but uh, very uh, asymmetric. Um, kind of an acquired uh, polybeak or high septal angle, little bit of uh, an amorphous uh, tip and persistent deviation of the columella. So she had already had three rhinoplasties and didn't have a whole lot of extra cartilage. Um, <clears throat> but um, with uh, using a little rib car, I do think that she is uh, significantly wider. Um, I think it's, I, I thought that it was a fine trade-off uh, considering some of the things we were to accomplish. Um, I think her columellar hanging or her flight is a lot better now. I tip, even though her tip highlights were there before, I think they look a little softer and better now. And I think the brow tip aesthetic is a little bit more normal um, than it was before. Um, 
So these are the things that we did. One of the biggest things was reducing this kind of residual anterior septum or high septum, uh, and then trying to re-support the tip so it had a little bit more structure and form. So it doesn't always have to be super complicated uh, in terms of the maneuvers. So if you look at the maneuvers, it wasn't, it wasn't particularly difficult maneuvers, but I think assessing what was wrong and then making sure that we fixed it support. So from the front, it didn't look like a horrible nose. Um, it looked a little bit too narrow, um, but it really had aged, you know, over the course of 12 to 15 years had aged in a way that was not helpful to her. So, so repositioned where her radix was, took down the residual anterior septal hump, rotated the tip again, and tried to give a little bit more support where she needed it. So not perfect, but also I think trying to accomplish a lot of things that we would normally want uh, her want this nose to kind of grow old with her a little bit more uh, better than it would have otherwise. So um, are there questions, concerns, um, comments, anything? Dr. Sethna, for the, the one that you just showed, did she have rib graft? Uh, she, I can't remember now. Uh, it was quite some time ago. Uh, she might have had, because she had had a non-functional rhinoplasty the first time, she might have had septal cartilage left. I see. So then that kind of super tip fullness is literally just left over yep. septum? Yeah. So could... so like, I think what happened is she lost a lot of tip support. So maybe her tip okay. was a lot higher before and she lost tip support. And now what could have just been like a small, like high septal angle turned into kind of like almost, not quite, but yeah, residual cartilaginous hump. And she was also really over-reduced. Like you can see here, like her radix here, right? Mm -hmm. And it's down here, like it's almost at her inferior limbus. So we, we managed to raise it with some crushed cartilage, but we certainly didn't bring it up as high as it could have gone. Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, her, her radix, like she just, I think they probably over reduced here and forgot to deal with the cartilaginous septum and then her tip dropped over time. So then it became under rotated as well. So with kind of thinking about like the longevity of our rhinoplasties, if we're all doing them, um, how, like, what do you think would be a strategy, strategy to make, sh not to make sure, but to kind of minimize the risk of the tip almost falling off the nose is what it looks like to me down the line. Yeah, I think so. The caudal septal extension graft thing, which, you know, I'm, it might, I've been doing a lot more of them the last five years or so um, instead of the columellar struts. So taking uh, septal cartilage or rib cartilage, whatever, um, and placing it. So if this, this is the normal septum and here is like the tip, then actually taking a section of septal cartilage and suturing it to the native septum, extending it between uh, tip cartilages and using that caudal septal extension mm. to persist support to the nasal tip, I think is really important. Now, they do get a lot of stiffness. And so that's something that you talk to them about. Um, and it can be really bothersome to the patient, especially if they're like, the biggest time that they get, that we get this complaint is when they're trying to kiss their significant other and their nose doesn't deform, <laughs> it used to. Um, that's, uh, honestly, that's the time where they say it. Like, is my nose ever gonna like be normal? So like, it gets better, but it's always gonna be a more rigid nasal tip with the caudal septal extension graft. But I think off. that you can, you can do tip sutures if somebody has a lot of inherent strength to their tip cartilages. I don't, you, I don't think you have to do a caudal septal extension graft in everybody, but, um, but I do a, a heck of a lot more of them now than I used to before. I see. Dr. Sethna, how do you uh, determine the, um, like your uh, support of your tip, if it's really weak or not weak, and is it just kind of a feel type thing? Because that can, I think, go a long way to determining what we're gonna put in there. Yeah, I, um, it is a feel kind of thing. I, I'm sure that there is a more 
objective way for me to do that. But, um, you know, I have a couple of different things that I think about. So if I have a patient that has a lot, has really thick skin, they probably have weak, inherently weak cartilages. So before I'm in, before I'm intra-op, if I'm seeing somebody that has thick skin, I tend to, to find that people that have really thin skin tend to have really strong, stiff cartilages because something's got to hold it, hold the nasal tip up. And people that have really thick skin, the skin envelope is doing a lot of the heavy lifting and the cartilages might be super weak. Um, and so that kind of clues me ahead of time that I'm probably going to want to build a lot of support uh, into this tip. But at the same time, intraoperatively, if, you're, if you don't have to do a cephalic trim to deform the cartilages and you just pinch them and they pretty much collapse and do whatever you need them to do, uh, I think we need to be thinking more about supportive, uh, kind of supportive type of reconstruction. <clears throat> Did that answer the question? Yeah, it just seems that uh, it's a, I, I didn't know if that was like a pre, you're talking about thin skin thickness from a preoperative standpoint, and I wonder how much of it is also intraoperative that, that you come across, just your analysis of the, the, the Yeah, lack for of the sure. I mean, I will, I will change uh, my plan if I need to um, intraoperatively, but um, most of the time, I'm not opposed to adding, if I have the extra cartilage, if I have a way of adding it, um, and I do tongue in grooves, which I might, 10 years from now, I might back off of that. But if I don't have extra cartilage, I have excellent Miller show and I have the opportunity to do a tongue and groove where I can kind of telescope the tip cartilages onto the caudal septum. If I can do to improve long-term tip support, I would, I would rather do that um, than, you know, 10 years later, have a completely different looking nasal tip um, than, than I intended. Um, but yeah, the, the degree of deformity of the cartilages can help like intraoperatively. If you're, if you're pinching the tip cartilages and they just kind of, you know, they have no stiffness, no support uh, to them, then oftentimes more support is necessary to be added after. Well, that, thank you guys. I hope that that was helpful. I know it was a lot of material to cover and I kind of, glossed over some things that are really complicated. So um, uh, my email address is on that uh, COVID Excel sheet. If you have questions um, or you wanna chat more, I'm happy to do it. Um, appreciate you guys and sorry that I ran a little bit over, but thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Sethna, that was awesome. Thank uh, you. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Sethna.